from my heart, but also preaching a little bit from Philippians. So if you've come here today to hear a message from me and it's been a while since you've heard me, you're like, Todd, why don't you preach here anymore? What's going on? Do you even work here anymore? Todd, thanks for coming to work this morning, but I haven't seen you from the pulpit. We got a couple more weeks of me just kind of talking to you. I wanna, I wanna gear you up for some things that are happening this fall and into the new year. And I'm excited to use the pulpit for this. Sometimes we need to do that to share a collective message so we can all get behind it. But we're gonna be jumping in for the next two weeks, a message entitled, Together. So this Tuesday, if you can believe it or not, marks one year that I've been at Woodenville Alliance. Can you believe that? One year. Angie and I were talking about it uh, all week long, saying, isn't that amazing what's, what's been happening and what's been going on over the last year? And sometimes I pinch myself because a year seems like it happened so fast. It also seems like it took so long to get here to this year. And if you recall, if you've been here and paying attention, hopefully you have, uh, last November, one of the first series that I spoke was called Together. And it was a really cool message, not because I wrote it, but because it came from the book of Acts. And the together that we talked about was what I believe is a perfect example of a New Testament church that's just getting birthed. A New Testament church that is just finding their fire from the Lord, figuring out who they are, figuring out the community that they find themselves in, and trying really desperately to stay true to the word of God and the spirit of God and moving forward together. And if you've studied the book of Acts, specifically chapter two and on, you see how God blessed the church, blessed the church with leadership and blessed the church with new converts and blessed the church with baptisms and blessed the church to people being sent out to do missions. It was such a beautiful time to experience the fullness of God. And we have a great example of that. And we dug into that. And if you, it's been a while and you've forgotten what that looks like, you can refer back to those series a year ago. But here we are a year later. And I want to talk to you specifically this morning about the church in Philippi. The letter from Paul to the church of the Philippians is a fantastic book to a church that's been established for about 11 years. Here's what's unique about this church. And if you're new to this church, and this is the first time you've been here this morning or maybe the first time you've heard me, uh, I'm gonna be talking very candidly over the next two weeks because I think we need to as a church. I think if we trace back to the roots of this church, I'm lead pastor number seven or eight. I don't know if you knew that, but in the 45 year history of this church, I believe I'm the seventh or eighth lead pastor. It's amazing, isn't it? It's amazing how many lead pastors have come and gone. And the beautiful thing about that is when a lead pastor comes on, oftentimes they bring a vision that stirs up the church, that stirs up the direction of the church and where we're going and what we're doing. They bring their gifts and their resources, their talents, their treasures, their years of seeking the Lord into a house and they say, here I am, I'm bringing this vision forth. But there's also something unique that happens when a leadership change happens at the lead pastor level. It's almost like the church has to find themselves again a little bit. So if my calculations are right, seven or eight times this church has tried to refine themselves. And if you've been here for any amount of time, some of you in this room have been here since day one. You've watched that process churn in and churn out. And it's uncomfortable and it gets difficult and then it gets exciting and then it gets sad and it gets frustrating and then it gets confusing. Can I talk about all those emotions this morning? Is that okay if we get that honest? Because as I've prayed for us over the last year, I've come into contact with all those things as I've prayed for you. As we've had conversations, as we've walked through this last year, I see all those things in your faces and in your lives. And there's a common cord of faithfulness in this church that absolutely blows my mind. The ability of people in this church to remain when things were confusing and shadowy, that's the hardest time to stay within a church. And I felt like when I came along in this last year, there are some things that we face together. We face leadership change and staff change. I watch people uh, leave the church. I watch people come into the church. I've had conversations with those that are in their teenage years saying, Todd, I'm just trying to figure out how to take my new faith and run after God. 
And I've talked to people well into their 80s that have said to me, Todd, there's only one question that you need to help me answer. When I stand before the Lord, and I know that these are the sunset years of my life, Todd, when I stand before the Lord, how am I going to receive from him the statement, well done, good and faithful servant? So in both of my hands are the young and the old and trying to help each and every person find the fullness that God has for them in the context of a church. And you all are amazing. You're amazing people. But many in this room, and I say this with love as your pastor, have such a strong opinion about where we're going and what we should do. And I welcome all those opinions. I welcome those things. You know, one of the things that makes us strong as Christians is we don't just put our questions on a shelf, that we don't just forget about the things that we're walking through together. We talk about them, and we talk about them in healthy ways so we can get further along the road together, so we can heal, so we can get free, so we can get closer together to what God has for us. And that's what he's been doing over and over and over again in this church. Several of the things that I talked about when I first started candidating for this job way back into the search team when they were meeting with me is some of the things that I was going to bring to this church. And I was never secretive about it. I was forthright. In fact, it took us nine months to walk through some of these things because we wanted to make sure that we are aligned as a church and a leadership in the direction that we are going in. And so I shared with them my absolute DNA as a human being, what I do is I make room for people to grow into leadership. And you may have recognized that this summer, the summer in the Psalms, there was so much room given to our staff. And many of you came to me and, they, and you said very jokingly, do you work here anymore? It's so great that you joined us here today on Sunday morning. And I want you to know that part of, part of what I do as a leader is I try to break down some of those stereotypes. So even though I have a vision and a heart for this church, one of those big pieces of my heart is to make sure that you know who your staff is. See, when someone works in children or with youth or young adults or leads us in worship, we get certain ideas about who they are and what they might believe and where they stand and where their heart is. Some of the best ways to learn who they are is to give them space to share a message. So summer in the Psalms, and I've heard so many positive things about this, was just that. It was for me to share with you the staff that you've loved on for so long. And didn't they all do an amazing job? They did. I was so blessed to be part of those services and just get ministered to by all the staff here. And I view our staff as fully grown adults. Isn't that amazing? I hope you do as well. They're not kids to me. They're fully grown adults. And I remember when I was in my 20s and I had a zeal for the Lord and I ran after the things of God, it was when I surrendered to the mentorship and the leadership around me that made me a better leader. And the coolest thing about my job is every week I get to sit with each of our staff and hear about their life, hear about their journey in Christ, hear about where they're going. And there's an incredible trust growing between us as a team. One of the first things I knew I needed to do over this year was to pull together our leadership team, the GC, our governing council, and our staff. I, I've, I've worked so hard with them to pull them together as a team. Countless hours of prayer and getting together and figuring out who we are as a team because I knew that leadership was so crucial to this church that not only was leadership crucial till now, but leadership is also crucial eventually in the later. So I, I've shared this pretty openly, but I'm being very candid with you this morning as this church and this body, that how I build is with the end in mind. So everything that I build here is so someday realizing that God willing, I will be here for a very long time, but there will be a time when I have to hand off this church to the person that God calls after me. And my heart is everything that we build here, everything that we do here remains. That it doesn't get burned up. It doesn't cause someone to take three or five years of their ministry call to fix things that are kinked and broken. So I say all this to you to say that one year ago in November, not quite a year ago in November, I spoke a message on 
a series of messages on being together and looking at that first century church, what it must have been like for the Holy Spirit to be moving in power and authority and healings and deliverances and freedoms and spiritual gifts just manifesting in the church. It must have been an amazing time to be alive. And as now we journey into this book, and I encourage you over the next couple of weeks, if you haven't spent a lot of time in the book of Philippians, to pick it up and look at it again. It's four short chapters. But in this book, you're going you're to learn so many things about Paul and the heart of who he was as a leader. And you're going to learn so much about this church that found itself in a community of all kinds of unlike people. There was people from all kinds of faith backgrounds ending up at this church. This church that when Paul showed up, his, his custom, when he, when he went to a town and he evangelized, he'd always go to the temple first. And that's where he preached, that's where he shared before he even started to build a church. In Philippi, there was nothing. There wasn't a temple at all, so he went down to the water. And we can look at Acts chapter 16 and 2 Corinthians and follow the journey of how Paul brought this church about bringing Lydia to the Lord, and so many great testimonies of what God did. But we have this church that Paul so loved that he spoke into and built for 11 years. And he found himself in prison writing them this letter. And he didn't know if he was going to live or if he was going to die. But he was sharing with his friends that he counted it all joy because he knew that not only did they participate in the life of Christ, but they also participated in the suffering of Jesus. They understood what all these things were, the dynamics and perplexities of being a human being serving Jesus. This church experienced all the ups, all the downs, all the changes, all the cry for, hey, we should do this or that. They experienced it all together. And the last three verses of Philippians chapter 1 sums up what Paul was trying to say to this church. And it's what I want to look at with you over the next couple weeks. And I want to dig into this scripture, this one verse, because I think in it will help project us forward to who we are as a church. So let's look at that one particular verse on Philippians chapter 1, verses 27. I'm going to read it out of the ESV this morning. Let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. So whether I come and see you or I'm absent from you, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Let me present it to you this way as a, as a bullet pointed list. Maybe it'll help you see the power of this verse from the Apostle Paul that we can glean so much from today. The first bullet point, standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. I'm going to keep that bullet point list in front of you as I kind of talk a bit more from my heart. It's very difficult as a church to stand firm if we're divided, if we don't know where we're going, if we don't know what we believe in. You may recall that after the first uh, John series that we did, Alex and I jumped into the fourfold gospel, explaining from our hearts how much we're going and reviving and revisiting the roots of the Christian Missionary Alliance denomination. Let me tell you one of the things that I was really attracted to about this church when I first heard that you were looking for a lead pastor. I cut my teeth many, many years ago in the Assemblies of God. It was the first denomination that I was ordained with. Assemblies of God is a cousin, so to speak, of CMA, some distances, but the roots go back to A.B. Simpson. And one of the things that I found and I'm finding in Christian Missionary Alliance, the strength of the checks and balances that I need as a leader. I told you from the day one that I'm not Superman. I'm never going to stand in front of you as a cape 
I don't want to do this all on my own. I don't want to build my own kingdom. I want God to release in us a vision that we can all grab a hold of, that we can all believe in, that we can all uh, step out in and stand in. And what I've found to be true so far in the Christian Missionary Alliance is how much support I get from our district and our national offices. I'm very connected to both. We just went to the national conference in Spokane and we're deeply challenged by it. And one of the things that I want to point out to each and every one of you is that is a big part and core of who we will always be. And that statement of faith at the core is who we are as a church. So if you don't know those 11 tenets of faith, you can access them on our website. They're easily to find on the web. You can find a book on one of our bookshelves that point out all those 11 tenets of faith that make this denomination unique. And you may discover that they're not that unique because they're all biblical, laid out in a way that you and I both can understand them. But in order for us to stand firm in who we are, all of us need to explore what that means to them. Because the closer we are to understanding that, the stronger we can stand together. Understanding that the Christian Missionary Alliance and the roots of who they are is a big part of who we are. And so our next series that we're stepping into in October for six weeks is called Deeper Life. And we're gonna be digging into the deeper life, A.B. Simpson, Tozer. We're gonna go back to the roots of this denomination once again and look biblically about who we are and what a deeper life in Christ is, what a deeper life together is. And the reason why I wanna do this with you is because I need all of us to be able to stand in the days ahead. Someone shared with me this morning that as our worship team was praying, what they were praying for all of us and what they were sensing in their, in their spirits and their hearts from the Lord is that there's been so much energy building walls or tearing down walls that the Lord wants us to begin to shift that energy into building bridges to connect generations to connect people in this community that are just missing it. Sometimes I sit in different offices in this church and look out the window at 145th here, and I can't believe the thousands of cars that drive by every day. And I wonder to myself, do they know we're here as a church body? Do we make an impact in this community? So I have a little action item for anyone that wants to take this. Find yourself driving around Woodenville today and stopping at gas stations or restaurants and ask them if they know where Woodenville Alliance is. And I'll, I'll let you discover what I've discovered by doing that. I want that heart to change in Woodenville. I want Woodenville to know we're here, not because I want them to just come here as a, as a congregant, that'd be fantastic, but I want them to know that there's a church in their community that's standing firm in this day and age. Each and every one of us, God is calling us up to stand firm in what we believe and who we are. And in turn, this leads to the next bullet point, being of one spirit. Now I know it's not this church and it's probably not this service, but it's very easy when you go to a church for a long amount of time to begin to just murmur and complain about all the things that aren't going well. Once again, I don't think it's this service, this group of people, I'm just throwing it out here for you to maybe receive something from me about this. We need to be of one spirit. How are we of one spirit? We stand firm in what we know, what we believe, the direction we're going in, and we begin to change our language one to the other. We begin to speak well of each other and well of what God is doing here. I believe with all my heart that the local church is the hope of this world. I believe that God instituted the local church. It's what I've poured my life out to. It's what my wife, Angela, has poured her life out to. We believe with all our heart that local church is called to make a difference in this world. That the Lord himself looks at us as his bride. That one day he'll come back for spotless and pure. Are we there yet? No, we're not there yet. How do we get there? We need to be of one spirit. And I challenge each of you, I, I do with all my heart as your pastor, 
we need to step into a season where we remain standing firm and in one spirit. And the third bullet point is one mind. We need to be one mind. And that doesn't mean that we all just walk around blindly and do things that we shouldn't do because someone else told us to do it. To be in one mind, understanding who we are in Christ, what God's done in us, what God is doing in us, what God wants to do in us, and being one mind about that. One of the things I love about leadership development is seeing the differences in all of us and how together we really do function as the body of Christ. Some are arms, some are legs, some are ears. I've met a couple armpits. They're still great to have around. They're needed. We're all needed. And when that body functions well together, it's amazing what God can do through us and in us. And with those three things in place, standing firm, in one spirit, with one mind, we begin to step into the areas that are, I'm just dreaming about right now. That we begin to strive together side by side for the faith of the gospel. To begin to do things that this community, locally, nationally, and internationally, we can do together. When we stop building the walls between us and start building bridges to further the gospel forward. And I dream about it all the time. I pray about it all the time. It's a huge part of what I journal and I think about. But I also know that this is a big deal, what we're trying to do together. Many, many years ago, when I was meeting with my pastor who was mentoring me, there's a, there's a certain fork that a pastor takes in his life when he knows one day the Lord is going to call him to lead a church. And the fork that I took, the two that you can choose from is either planting a church or coming alongside a church that's been established to help them go where God's called them to go. The consistency I hope that you see in me is that I was made to walk alongside a church that's already been established to help them go forward where God wants them to go. People call me nuts and out of my mind because it's a hundred times harder why is it 100 times harder? Because just like I shared before, there's been seven or eight transitions in your midst. And to build that trust to each other is what Paul was talking to us about in the book of Philippians. He called them to unity and joy because of what they've lived together through. In the book of Acts, they were called to unity because of what Christ did and now they're following him. The book of Philippians is called to unity because of what they've gone through together and that they remained and they were still together doing it. So my challenge to us today is to look at this scripture and I believe the Lord placed it in my spirit to share with you over the next two weeks to get in a little more deeper into the direction I feel and the, the leadership and I have been praying into and where we feel the Lord is leading us. And as we share those things, and as they develop more and more, I need you to know my philosophy of ministry is this. I'm not going to come to you with a vision that I made up and say these are the three ways that you can get involved. The vision that the Lord is stirring up in this house is at its core. It already exists here. It's already at the DNA of this church. And my job as your pastor, as your shepherd, is to help draw that vision out for all of you to get involved in it. Because I know one thing about leadership development, people get engaged where they feel they're helping develop something. And we're at that stage right now as a church. There's so much beauty here and so much history. There's so much in the past and the present and what's ahead in our future. But we need to learn to stand firm together, to be of one spirit with that one mind that only Christ can give us, until we learn to start striving side by side in our differences, in the things that make us peculiar, in that 16-year-old and that 82-year-old man that I talked to, working together side by side for the faith of the gospel, moving the kingdom of God forward. And what I'm asking you to consider, to prayerfully consider over the next two weeks, is your role that you'll play in that. And I've worked with all kinds of people through the years. 
it doesn't matter how old you are or how young you are, I believe that God has called a family together in a church to do things for his kingdom. And for all of us to discover that together so we can strive side by side. As you look into the book of Philippians chapter 1, you'll begin to see how Paul encouraged them in their story. How much each of us matter to the kingdom of God. The story we carry into the kingdom of God. Who we are, how we choose to live, actually becomes an encouragement to someone like Paul who finds themselves in jail, but still hears about what the church is doing and the faith walk of the community. And that's exactly what this church did to Paul. Who they were encouraged him. And they were behind him. And it caused him to be free to say, Lord, I'm okay if I'm taken home because I'm martyred. But it might be better if I remain because there's so much work to do in the local church. If you're here today, and that's the conversation you're having with God, I want you to remain in his house so we can be who God's called us to be together. I want to share one thing with you. Uh, before I have the worship team come back up and close. Once again, this is part one and part two. I'm really calling us up to look at this scripture and to step in it together. But I want to make one announcement to you. Uh, and it'll be on the slide behind me. Uh, starting October 1st, and you may have already heard this through the newsletter that I've sent out to let you know, I, I think that this is a really good season and good time to go back to one service. I know that if you've been here for any amount of time, you've gone two service, one service, two service, one service, you've lived it before. Okay, I know this is nothing new to you. And maybe you've done it seven times with all the seven pastors that have come, I don't know. But our room is big enough for all of us to be get together. We have so much room for so many more chairs in here. And for a season, I feel the Lord calling us together to be one church with one message so we can get that one vision together. The mission is simple. The mission's never changed since Jesus called his church to go make disciples of all nations. That's the mission of the church. You don't need another mission. We know what our mission is, and you know to some extent we're doing it really well as a church. But the vision, the way we're going to do it together, I've already been pretty candid this morning, so I'll, I'll be just a little more candid today. The way I view it here, and it's something that I've been praying about, it's like all of you have ropes tied around your waist and all the ropes go to the middle and you're all running in different directions and you're all passionate and you're all hungry and you all love Jesus and you want to see his kingdom increased and you know who the Lord is and you love this church, but you're all running in different directions. And so you're standing still and you're exhausted. I don't want you to be exhausted. There's another way to have a vision. There's another way to move together forward. And so for a season starting October 1st, we're going to come together as one church with one message till we find that one vision. And that same day to get you here, we're going to do a picnic together, a cookout together. So we're going to be reaching out to some folks if you're interested in helping out with that. But it's always easier to do things when there's food attached, isn't there? So we're going to have a nice cookout together on that Sunday. My heart for all of you, if you're in this room and you're hearing my voice, would you spend a season with us, with your leadership, praying into this? Why are we taking so much time sharing what the vision is? Because I have 10 visions I could share, but that wouldn't be fair to you or me. Because visions shouldn't be burdensome and burn out a church and burn out the staff. A vision should move the kingdom of God forward and be exactly what this church is called to do. And I believe this church is built in such a strategic place. There's so many natural things we can talk about. We're so set up for the future. We're a debt-free church in a debt-free building on debt-free land. It's amazing to say that out loud. We are set up to do what God's called us to do in this season, in this time. And I'm calling all of you up to pray with me to get alone with the Lord, to read this particular book with me, specific, specifically chapter one. And let's discover what our vision is together 
and to stand firm. Put that bullet point back up, please. Stand firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. I want to see Jesus change this world. I want to see his spirit change each and every one of us to the point that it's irresistible. This is the time that we live in now. The world needs Jesus. And I'm asking all of you to step up with me and to discover together what the vision is for this church. What the unique call of God is on this church. And I know this next year is going to be amazing. Worship team, would you come back up while I pray? Lord, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your heart, for your church, for your people. God, I'm so blessed to be able to be the lead pastor. I'm humbled. I'm excited. And some days I'm frustrated. But that doesn't matter. I choose to stand with this church. I choose to stand with your children. I choose to speak life over this church and over your people. I choose to think well of things that I don't understand until I can find out the truth. I choose to shut down conversations that aren't healthy until I know what the truth is. And Lord, I stand with this church and the future that you've called her to. Lord, we bless you today, and we thank you for all that you're doing. In Jesus' name. Would you all stand with me while we...